Um, so I am not an archaeologist, but I will not apologise. <laughs> I am a proud non-archaeologist because I am in a fortunate position that my good colleague, Carly Amin, is an archaeologist and will keep me on track. So we are here today representing a wider project that is an interdisciplinary effort to understand how previous cultures have interacted with new things. And because new things is quite a broad category, we've chosen to focus on animals and religion. And we're looking at uh, what we're calling the shifting baselines, particularly around hares, rabbits, and Easter. So that's the broad context. What are we doing here today? So we're interested today in the hare goddess, the British hare goddess, who I'm sure you're all familiar with. Good. Um, so what we're going to be asking is, can we identify female figures in British culture that are associated with hares? Uh, what were their semantic centres, and can we trace their shifting baselines? Don't worry, I'll come back to those concepts in a moment. Uh, but we're also going to try and tie what we're finding into uh, local uses of the environments, both uh, kind of geographically but also historically. So uh, I'm going to talk first and foremost a little bit about theory. I'm going to mention these uh, semantic uh, centres and shifting baselines before I dive into five potential hair goddesses. Now, given the time constraints here, I'm going to have to be very superficial. Um, we do have some research to back up the statements I'm making, and I'm very happy to talk about that later. But I am going to try and draw broad comparative conclusions here. So, let's start with shifting baselines then. Shifting baselines is a theory that comes out of fisheries management, which I'm sure you're all familiar with as a hotbed of theoretical development. So this is the idea that... Um, Things change over time, but we don't always recognise it. So you had fisheries scientists who started their careers, and whatever the ecological context was at the start of their career, they assumed that was the baseline going forward for the next 20, 30, 50 years. The problem is the people who were starting their careers five years later were dealing with a different baseline. Um, and you go to school children today and ask what colours a squirrel, you're going to get told grey. Get a time machine, go back 50 or 60 years, what colours a squirrel? It's red. So we're dealing then with things that are changing gradually over time. And this, this is particularly interesting in terms of animal introductions, which is something that our wider Easter project is looking at. Now, if we were to try and look at how uh, a, the baseline of a god might shift, that's quite difficult. Gods are notoriously hard to pin down. So one tool for doing so that's been developed in the, the sociological study of religion is something called the semantic center. And this is the idea that um, gods and cultural figures generally often have a lot of attributes and associations and stuff they're linked to. So uh, the god Odin, for example, the pre-Christian king deity who's associated with warfare and magic and secrets and poetry and all these different things. If you boil it down, it really just comes down to knowledge that is expressed differently. So different people might have regarded Odin in different ways, but for all of them, his knowledge was what mattered. Maybe he was a great tactician. Maybe he was a great poet. Maybe he knew secret knowledge, but it's knowledge that counts. So, should we see if we can figure out what the semantic centres of some hair goddesses were? Let's start in Iron Age Britain. And I apologise in advance if I call it Celtic. Apparently archaeologists aren't supposed to do that. Um, so, in Iron Age Britain, the hair is a recent introduction, or the brown hair at least. It's quite a new thing. And as new animals... Uh, I just see we've got the wrong slide. Whoops, sorry. Um, new animals... Um, often have special status in certain cultures. So with the hare, um, there appears to have been a taboo against eating it. We have this recorded in Julius Caesar. Uh, there's also a naming taboo. So an awful lot of Indo-European languages use Noah names for the hare, like Welsh that refers to it as a gorse cat, or Latin sometimes calls it the eared one. Um, we also find in, Celt uh, in, sorry, in Iron Age contexts in Britain, um, articulated bone groups. Um, this is not an articulated bone group of a hare, sadly. Carly sent me uh, the picture and I forgot to change it. Uh, this is an articulated bone group of a chicken, so I apologise. Um, but take my word for it, we do, we do have articulated bone groups that suggest ritual deposition of hares. Now, in terms of religion, um, we do have an awful lot of Celtic deities that are linked with animals. And what's interesting about the Celtic deities in, in this context is that a lot of them are part animal, part human, and they often appear with animal attributes in semi-human form. And there's a, a lot of deities we can link to different animals. So uh, Cernanos is, is a major Celtic deity. We've got evidence for him from all over Europe. Uh, he's associated with stags. Or Epona, associated with horses, later became very popular with Roman auxiliary cavalry. Or Artio, the, uh, the Swiss <coughs> bear goddess. Do we have a hare goddess? Not really, at least not obviously. 
The closest we can get is uh, Cassius Dio, so a Greek um, Roman citizen, wrote a history of, of the Roman Empire, and he mentions Boudicca's rebellion in uh, the first century AD, where apparently Boudicca declares her rebellion, and then from the folds of her dress lets her hair run out, and this is a, a divinatory ritual. So far, so good. Um, when she's finished with that, though, what she does then is she praises a deity, Andraste. We don't really know very much about Andraste, but it's certainly not impossible she was a hair deity of some sort. Um, she's only witnessed in this one text, and speaking generally, Celtic, deity, Celtic goddesses tend to be very kind of broad. They often serve uh, opposite domains, so both war and fertility is very common. Here's some imagery suggesting war deities, war goddesses. Now, later in that same text, Cassius Dio refers to Andrate this time um, as, this is what they call Nike. So this would definitely suggest she was a war deity, I think. Um, now, sadly, neither Victoria nor Nike, the kind of amalgamated Greco-Roman cult, uh, has any animal imagery whatsoever. She has wings, she appears sometimes with a shield or a wreath, but no animals. So this is perhaps not the, the strongest example of a hair goddess, but in terms of semantic centre, we're very definitely looking at warfare. What about Romano-Britain, if we move forward a little bit? Well, we've already covered uh, some Roman attitudes uh, to animals today, which is great. Uh, so we have things like Leporaria, so these, these kind of domestic zoos almost, where hares and other animals were kept for food and for hunting, but also as pets. And they appear in a fair amount of Roman iconography. If you look at the graph here, what we're actually finding is we're finding a huge spike in hair-based iconography in the Middle Roman period. Now, this is largely attributable to these. These are plate brooches. Plate brooches have been linked to religion in Roman Britain because a lot of them seem to show animal icons that have been linked with different cults. So, Epona, the horse goddess I mentioned earlier, we've got some, some little uh, plate brooches of horses, and we have the, the anonymous rider god, who's a Romano-Celtic amalgamation. Or Mercury, um, who has cockerels, but also non-animal things, secondary aspects that refer to his status as a traveller, like the sole of a shoe or a purse. Who might we want to assign the hair to? We've got some great hair brooches, including this one um, <coughs> centre-left, which seems to be pregnant. It's got two little leverets inside it. Or the one next to that, on the right there, that shows a hair cowering in the undergrowth. Well, one suggestion is what well, and Andraste. She didn't just go away once the Romans invaded. I mean... In fact, the whole fact that Boudicca is rebelling against the Romans suggests that she was still around in Roman Britain. Another possibility, though, is maybe we're dealing with Diana. So Diana Artemis was another one of these amalgamate cults in the Roman Empire. Um, she is a hunting deity. She appears in her iconography with a bow accompanied by dogs and often associated with the deer, the thing that is hunted. Now... Diana, we don't get a lot of evidence for her cult in Britain, and where we have it, it tends to be very high status, and the few named inscriptions we have are mostly foreigner names. So it doesn't seem to be the locals who are worshipping Diana as Diana. And this might be because the deer, the holy animal associated with Diana in the Mediterranean, was already spoken for in the British context, where it was linked with Celtic masculine hunter deities like Cernanos and Codicus. So what I would suggest instead of just, or what we would suggest, sorry, instead of just Andraste or just Diana is actually the Romanization of Andraste, a kind of a, another amalgamate where we don't just have Andraste or Diana Artemis, we have Andraste Diana Artemis, who instead of taking the deer symbol, took the hair. Now this has the advantage of further Romanizing British culture, which the Romans were quite big on. And it ties in neatly with some of the other things that Diana gets up to. So uh, in, in Rome uh, and in the Mediterranean generally, there are cases where s escaped slaves seek asylum at Dianic temples. Perhaps what we're dealing with here then is a, an articulation, a reflex of the Diana goddess um, that is not focused so much on the hunting aspect of things or on the hunter side, but on the hunted side, the prey side. Okay, next up, Eostra. This is someone we all know, Easter. So this is where we get the word Easter from in, uh, in English. And as we all know, according to Bede, this is because she was the goddess whose festival took place in April. And this is what kind of where we get the modern Easter from. So uh, according to Bede, writing in 725, he's, he's going through all of the old Roman and Greek calendars. And he's saying, ah, oh, yes, uh, the Romans called this month this, and the Greeks called that month that. And he's, he's kind of 
uh, summarizing little myths and telling little stories about where these months got their names from. He then does the same for the Anglo-Saxon calendar. But there's been a lot of long-standing scholarly skepticism <coughs> saying, ah, oh, come on, are you, are you sure? There's, there's not really much evidence for this. Um, and in particular, there's, there's concern about his suggestion that Eostra was a deity and not a festival. So maybe there was no Eostra deity in the first place. Maybe she was an etymological fancy. There is, however, a lot of, a lot of discussion around the idea that she might have been a dawn goddess associated with daybreak. This is because her name, etymologically, comes from a Germanic root, oistas, meaning uh, to the east or from the east. So scholars in the line of Jacob Grimm and a lot of people since then have argued that she was, in fact, a dawn deity, a reflex of a wider Proto-Indo-European figure, Huesos. Now, Huesos is assumed to be both a proper name of a deity, but also literally a, a proper, a common noun meaning dawn. This is the same thing we find in uh, in the Vedas, Rig Veda. In Sanskrit, uh, we have Eos. In Greek, we have Aurora. In Latin, we have Azarine in Lithuanian. This is relatively well attested, but uh, it doesn't necessarily work out with the Ostra. For a start, Eostra's name comes from east, whereas the vernacular term for dawn or daybreak in Old English, Degrel, uh, comes from de, uh, not east. So that's difficult. We also have no comparative evidence from the continent where we might expect to find some. Uh, Jacob Grimm, for example, misled a lot of people by positing a Germanic continental deity that didn't actually exist. Now, we've got another suggestion, another theory about where we might uh, look for some sort of semantic centre to Riostra, and this is a colleague of ours on our project, Phil Shaw, who has suggested that, yes, we're still dealing with easterliness, but it's on a much more local scale, not a global thing, watch the sun rise in the east. We're instead dealing with deities belonging to the people east of here, or the easterners. So uh, we're dealing with sub-tribal or sub-kingdom social groups. Uh, if you know Latin, this is the Pagus, or Old High German, the Gau, uh, probably took the form of year in Old English. And what Shaw suggests is that we're looking at a tutelary deity. She was the goddess of the Easterners in Eastern Kent. Sorry, sadly, we've been cut off a little bit here. I really have messed up the slides today, I apologise. Uh, but there are three place names in England that have the same early Anglo-Saxon, or early Old English root uh, as Eostra, which isn't East, it's Eastor, an early form. Uh, these are in East Ridington, in the East Riding of Yorkshire, Estria in um, Peterborough, and then Eastry in Kent, which is the eastern half of Kent. Now, it's possible that what happened was that Bede went fishing for Anglo-Saxon month names to impress his readers, because at the time, everybody around him just called it April. Uh, okay, what did we used to call it? Oh, I've no idea. I'll ask my correspondents. He asks his correspondents. We know he had correspondents in Canterbury, and they might have been able to supply him with a dialect word, Eostamorna. So it might well be that Bede himself was the one who gave Eostra her big break. Problem here is that, okay, fine, we've got a semantic centre, she's a tutelary deity. There's absolutely no link with Lagomorphs. Um, the earliest reference to an Easter bunny or an Easter hare, as it actually started out, is from the Heidelberg region of Germany in the 17th century. And frankly, even that isn't very secure because we've got much, much more recent 21st century accounts, no wait, 20, 20th century accounts of the Easter fox in other parts of Germany. So we don't really... We can't really associate Easter as a Christian festival and Lagomorphs. No dice there. Um, next up, St. Melangath. This is a, a favourite of mine. She is the Catholic Saint of Hares. I bet you didn't know we have one of those. Um, so we don't know a great deal about Melangath, and her cult is highly restricted. By highly restricted, I mean there is one church and one text. We are very lucky to have this text. It's post-Reformation, but it shows signs of having been based on earlier written accounts. Um, the story goes that Melangath was an Irish princess who was going to be married off to somebody she didn't want to marry. So uh, as princesses did in this period, in the 6th century, she ran away to Wales and lived as a holy hermit. Having lived in the, in the wilderness for however, for however many years, um, she is happened upon by a local prince who is hunting hares. A hare bursts out and hides under her skirts, and she gives it sanctuary, asylum. And the prince is so moved by her sanctity that he grants her some land and says, you can have sanctity here, you can set up a, a lay community. Um, and then there's, there's other stories attached to this about how over the years since St. Melanga has protected people seeking asylum in this area. Um, we went to visit the church, which is great, it's 12th century. And we would actually point to the 12th century as being possibly a moment when there's a kind of a resurgence 
in the cult of Malangath, particularly because this is the point where the Church of Powys is trying to kind of clamp down on, on kind of more independent expressions of churches, reorganize things into parishes. And possibly what we're looking at then is a very, very old um, kind of society that's very used to dealing with its own landscape. There's a very long time depth here. So the, the parish at, at Malangath, the church, is based in a graveyard that has Bronze Age burials. The churchyard's uh, wall is based on a potential Anglo-Saxon ring ditch. There are yew trees marking out the edge of the churchyard that have been dated to 2,000 years old. This is definitely a very long-standing cult site. And it might even be, given the fact that there is a, a holy spring dedicated to Malangath nearby, what we're looking at is one of those Irish-type saints that are definitely not saints. They were almost certainly pre-Christian Celtic deities who lived in this particular piece of water. The priests came along, the missionaries came along, couldn't get people to stop sacrificing or whatever, so they renamed it after a saint and everybody's happy. So maybe what we're looking at then is Malangath's Celt as being a long-standing uh, local phenomenon that is very much based on the local landscape. So the historia, this text, stresses that it's these local lay figures, the abbots it calls them, though they're not abbots in the way we understand them, that should control who gets asylum at this church. So if a criminal comes here, um, the bishop from Paris can't just turn up and say, hand them over, I'm the bishop. He has to ask them first. And even today, in fact, there is a local mental health sanctuary run by the parish. So this really is a long-standing thing, and we would therefore suggest that Malangath has a, a semantic centre as the tutelary, not of a people, as we saw with the Ostra, but of a place. And then finally, our final potential hair goddess. Well, if you ever go on the internet at any time around Easter, you'll get this, which is all sorts of people throwing around different ideas about the development of Easter as a festival, as a goddess. There are links to uh, Eostra, often badly misspelt. There are links to Babylonian Ishtar. And people go back and forth and get very, very worked up about this. We even have some wonderful examples where people are creating these kind of palimpsestic texts where they correct each other's posts. There's one here in the middle where you see correct, mixed, and false in different colours. Now, we're not going to actually try and debunk any of this, most of which is rubbish, but we are just going to point out that we are still using today the figure of some sort of hair deity in our modern culture, and she bears meaning. And that meaning, at least in this context on the internet, is expressing a, a very contemporary concern we have about access to reliable information or control of the truth in the digital age. So I'm going to wrap up and by, uh, just kind of summarize here. We're looking at five different deities, five different goddesses. Some of them are very clearly associated with hairs, Malangath, for example. Some of them we've seen today are not associated with hairs at all, like Eostra. We're also looking at a range of different semantic centers, a range of different core concepts to these deities, everything from war to information control. Nonetheless, there does seem to be a, a kind of, perhaps a long-standing reuse of certain ideas associated with these goddesses, and that is quite possibly linked directly to the hair itself. The idea of asylum, the idea of fleeing and protection, we don't really see it with Andraste, but we do see it, frankly, with, with Artemis, uh, Andraste, Diana Artemis. We do see it with Malangath. And to a certain extent, we might also suggest we see it with Easter, with, with people kind of going back and forth and, and arguing about whose ideas are right. Um, if you're, I'll, I'll wrap up here. If you're interested in what we're doing, please, by all means, uh, follow us on Twitter. And thank you very much for your attention.